a very good Thursday. Race fans, welcome to our latest Stats Race Lens webinar, and we've got a terrific card of racing Saturday at hmm. Fairgrounds, the next level as things move towards the Fairground Oaks and the Louisiana Derby. Absolutely terrific uh, slate of races, and we're going to dive into them. And we've got Craig Walker, of course, from Equibase and Stats and uh, help uh, develop it. And absolutely thrilled to have Ellis Starr, the Uber capper, back with us today. And Ellis, uh, first and foremost, congratulations again on the charity contest win, NHC weekend, and everybody uh, rooting for you health-wise. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Steve, and everybody out there. It was a lot of fun. I was honored to have been asked to participate and uh, got lucky with a couple of horses, the courtesy of Race Lens, um, which we'll be talking about. Hopefully, we'll help some people get lucky today as well, as well as help them understand how I handicap using Race Lens and how they can do it. Well, and that's what uh, we've been doing the last, uh, now it's getting close to uh, nine months, ten months of it, and the big cards like this, and particularly when we get these three-year-old races that uh, come up as part of the Trail Ford Classic season, there's certain, you know, certain kinds of things that are reliable that, that come up all the time, and uh, certainly Race Lens, uh, a, a great tool to dig out to those kinds of, you know, those kinds of opportunities. Craig, of course, we were together uh, weeks, what, uh, two weeks ago, and uh, helped uh, dig out a, a few winners, I think, and uh, between uh, Dan Torjman and, and you. Uh, we're going to try to do the same thing tonight on this great card for Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. Ho hopefully we'll we'll have some nice winners, and uh, for sure we'll be able to sh show some of the features that Race Lens has and some of the things that are unique to the product. So it'll help people handicap better and hopefully get them some winners. Well, and I uh, want to welcome everybody that's uh, signed on. And if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them out there. We'll feather them in. Some will get answered uh, off the air. Others uh, we'll bring up and discuss. And we're actually going to start late in the card. And we're going to move around a little bit. And uh, I, right, Craig, we're going to take it in the order that uh, the outline? Yeah. So, yeah, we'll start off with the 12th race, which uh, is part of the – is the ending to one of the pick four, so uh, players will be able to tie it into to some of the stakes races at the fairgrounds on Saturday. And so uh, the main feature I wanted to to show in this race is something that we uh, recently added to the True Odds module. So I have the um, True Odds module here on the screen. And so I'm going to start with um, looking at um, – the race, the, the races now, what we have added is uh, a feature called f filter sets. And so the filter sets affect the adjusted true odds. So this, this far right column is the adjusted true odds column. And so if, I, if I'm going to, I'm going to sort on this column, and we see that the two horses that are highlighted here are number eight, Sly Tom, and number 12, Call Me West. So the adjusted true odds, the Whatever comes up for the odds in that column, that's what are considered to be fair odds based on the way that the algorithm is working. So in this case, Sly Tom, the acceptable odds to bet on it would be 5 to 2, and number 12, Call Me at West, would be 7 to 2. So when the um, program is activated now, before there's live odds, it's going to compare the adjusted true odds to the morning line odds. So right now, five to two is less than seven. Five to two is less than nine to two, and seven to two is less than eight to one. So these both offer value, and so that's why they're going to be highlighted in yellow. So any time that the adjusted true odds is lower than the morning line odds before the live odds come in, that's how this highlighting is going to be activated. But after that, the actual live odds will be used, and that and that'll the highlights will be compared to the live odds instead of the morning line odds. So so what we added was filter sets. And I'm going to bring up the, the interface now. So when you click, a user clicks on adjusted 1% probability factor, 
this is showing these sliders are showing the priority that the user has put on on the various factors that go into creating the adjusted true odds. So this is this filter set here is uh, is one that I created just for my own personal use called slow paced routes. And I, I'm going to in a minute I'm going to show how that gets activated. But right now I'm just going to go over the way that I thought I think that a slow paced route what's important to me. So anybody who's using race lens can adjust these factors however they want for certain types of races. So for me in a slow paced route I I want to uh, increase the importance of the speed category and that's why I make it a 3. I adjust the distance up slightly. I think jockeys are important in those types of races so I've made that a, to a factor of 4. The pace I've put up to a factor of 4 that's tied in with the jockey and because the pace is going to be slow that that becomes important and then also uh, some of the performance on today's track I think is important in those situations and that's why I made that a 2. So we can go look at how um, this filter set was set up. So if you click on edit set and then this is the priority list of all the different types of filter sets that are created. So we've created some for the users to use right now. So if you had this two-year-old dirt route, two-year-old turf routes, those are things that are activated now that a, a, that a user will find activated in the adjusted true odds just without doing anything. If I go down to the slow paced route and I click on edit, you'll see this has the this is where I as I or any user can create their own type of filter sets. So the settings are the ones that we saw previously because it was a match. So so a user can put these however they want the different factors at the bottom of the screen for the adjusted one percent probability. And those things will get matched whenever the categories up at the top get matched. So in this case, the distance I set to a route and the pace I set as slow paced. So a user can use any of these things. They can they can do this change the surface to tur to turf or all weather, to dirt, they can change track condition, they can do it by purse level. So these are the factors that are going to be matched. So in this case, the, the, when we look at the commentary over here, it was slow paced, and today's a route. So when that when that those categories were matched, that this became the the filter set that shows everything the adjusted true odds. So that's how all that works, and um, it just takes a little bit getting used to. But really, once you set up those those factors the way that you want them, and then you prioritize them on the list. When you go on the edit, when you click on edit sets, you can just move these rows up and down, and the, and the, and the algorithm just goes down the list. And once there's a match that's toggled on, that's what's going to be used for for that for for the adjusted true odds that you see. So once you play around with this a little bit, you'll get the hang of it, and uh, it makes it really nice because you can do you know turf routes one day with different different factors. Dirt routes a different way, turf sprints a different way, two year old races a different way. Just ha have all those set up, and then that's all done manually, but all done automatically so that you don't have to do those types of things manually. But you can adjust them manually from there, just on a race by race basis. When you're looking at something, you think, oh, this race, the trainer is really important, and you can move that factor up on a race by race basis. If a person doesn't want any uh, of these factors to be in place, any of the filter sets, they just would toggle everything off. You would go down the list and toggle it off and then click save. And then the adjusted true odds column is just going to be the same as the true odds column. So everything here, these two columns would be exactly the same if all those filter sets were turned off. And we've had some users ask about that. And so that's the way to do that if you just want the adjusted true odds to be the same as the true odds and let the, the highlighting go from there. So that, that's basically how how that all works. So for me in this race, there's two horses that stand out, and um, we can just look at the PPs real quickly. Mm 
when I look at this eight horse slide, Tom, one of the things that we're going to talk about, Ellis is going to explain a lot of the different features that are found in the race lens past performances. And one of the factors that we use is the uh, class rating. So when you, when you look up here in the race header with the class rating of 99, when you're going through the PPs of horses, you, you want to see horses that are going to run speed ratings, the Equibase speed figures that are around that number. So when we look at the last the Equibase speed figure of the last race for Sly Tom, we can see that he ran 105 Equibase speed figure, which is much better than the 99, which is around the number that you would expect a horse to need to run to, to, run, to win today's race. So that's a positive factor. And also, um, in the TrackMaster format, and the user can create other formats. If they want p the pace figures to be shown, then you can see the pace figures on the running line. So when we see here the early and the middle pace figures for Sly Tom, uh, the 197, we can see those are improving from the last couple races, the same way that his speed figure did. So all in all, it looks like this horse is rounding back into form figure-wise. So that makes that horse look like a strong choice. The other horse that I uh, that I like in this race that we looked at was Call Me West. And so that horse um, was 7 to 2 in the adjusted true odds. When we look at the Maureen Lawn odds of 8 to 1, that's a big overlay. And if we look at the second race back, this horse ran 105 Equibase speed figure, which if he was uh, able to come back to that race, that would make him a strong contender here. Also, when another feature of race lens is this highlighting that we have for um, for the um, situational statistics for the trainer. And you can see the green here and the positive ROIs. That's all very strong. And so that makes the source uh, look strong from the, the trainer angle. Same thing with uh, Jockey Robbie Alvarado. Lots of green there. So that's that's all positive. So those two horses uh, stand out. And for me, that's those are the two horses to play uh, in this race. Alice, how about you? Alice? <laughs> Did we lose Alice, Greg? Uh, I guess so. I'm not sure. Are you there, Alice? Can you hear me now? Oh, now there I can hear is. you, Alice. There you go. There I'm sorry. Okay. Not so, at yeah, all. Now, Steve, so this, this, this was left over from last this webinar, Craig going over this portion, and, you know, we're going to start talking about the races we promised everybody when we were promoing this webinar, the Risk Star and the Mine Shafts, and how uh, I customized my PPs and talk about the races and hopefully get some winners, but also show everybody how they can save time as well as use some of the valuable content that's available. Very good, and I, you know, and as you as you change the screen, I, Craig, I, I will ask one question, and you know, people should realize that those changes that were made to the true odds, uh, the factors, and those all came from suggestions, and so you know, the more people uh, tinker with and delve into race lens, the more responsive uh, Craig and and the and the team can be in, in terms of even improving it further and, and making it even that much more valuable. And Craig, the only question I would ask, and maybe we could slip it in when we talk about the Risen Star, which we'll discuss next, when we get to that portion, is how people can feel confident about their own opinions in terms of making those adjustments on the slide and understanding how they're influencing the way true odds will respond. I, and I'd love you at some point to kind of feather that in as we look at it uh, here with, with the feature. All right. Okay. All right, Alice, go ahead. All right. Well, this is, of course, as we mentioned earlier, a real important race, the first 50-point race for the winner in the uh, road to the Derby Series. And uh, it's also our Equibase Race of the Week. And, I use race lens extensively to handicap it, look at some things. So for those that most I don't know which attendees or people
people that already have race plans or considering race plans. So we'll start. There are basic past performance templates, we call them. And you can see track maps or echo base and stats. And then you start with one. But I have a bunch of my own. And this is what this webinar is about, about customizing. So we also put up a bunch of situational ones, which we create that everybody gets when they use the program. And then user templates, which then you can create yourself. And we'll get to those as well. But right now, we're going to look at a situational template. So because this race is a dirt route, um, there's a template that says, down at the bottom here, it says, today's track and surface. So this is going to be looking at fairgrounds on dirt, not necessarily routes. The other one is dirt spare and dirt route, same as today. This knows automatically if today's race is a route, it's going to look dirt routes. It's going to highlight those. The others will be a little lighter, lighter gray. If not, you, you won't see them. So I'm going to switch to that template. It takes a half a second here, dirt spare and dirt route. And you'll notice right away just by, with Gervin um, that both his races, one was turf, one was a dirt sprint. So neither of them is a dirt sprinter route same as today because he has not run in a dirt route. Now, I also have another one, um, which I'll talk about in a while, which is called Today's Track, Surface, and Distance, which means fairgrounds, dirt sprint, fairgrounds, dirt route, fairgrounds, turf sprint, and fairgrounds, dirt route. Um, and for a lot of races, that'd be better because it's going to give you a bigger set of PPs that are black as opposed to gray. But with these guys, it doesn't matter because none of these horses have run more than seven or eight times so far. Um, just so you'll know, anytime you want to check what one of these sets comprises, for example, this dirt sprinter route Simba today, you go to customize PPs. This is where you can create your own, or you can take one of the ones, the expert sets, or one of the situational sets like this one, and using the pencil icon, which is edit, you can, and you can then rename it up here, and it'll become a user template. Let's just say for the sake of discussion, this one only has five lines available. Well, you can't change that one because you can't really change. You can modify it and save it as something else. But you can't change one of the ones that we supply. So if you want to go to Lifetime or 12, I actually have all selected here. But let's just say you want to go to 12, you would just switch up to 12. You would change it, for example, to 12 line. And you may name it something so you're going to know what it is. And then down at the bottom, you'll save it. And there's lots of different things that you can tweak in here. You could have 20, 30, 40. There's really no limit to the number of past performance sets you could have. So that's an example. So we'll note just for this particular one, which was Sprint Sprint Rattle. At today, it was looking at under the filter PP line section, you can see there's all these different choices. It was today's distance under it. So it knows whether the distance is, is exactly sprint or a route. So we're going to go back just to show what that was about. Go back to the PPs. And we're going to go to Gervin. And some of the, again, there's pre-populated highlights here. So um, the custom highlights that you have here, like I have, had one. Actually, I'm going to go back to, now that I showed how that applies, I'm going to go back to the one I have that I use pretty much a lot, which is Lifetime PPs, because everything is in black. And this is where I've pre-highlighted some things as well. So you can see this. Highlight, and you don't have to remember what it is because when you hover over everything, it will display what it says. So in this case, it's the second highest PPs for the horse. You can see an equi base speed figure of 97. This is the highest speed figure for the horse. And again, back in customized PPs, you can set colors, whether you want it to be filled or circled, all kinds of different things you can do. Um, let me show real quick what that is, by the way, because that's a unique set again. So this would be in the past performance templates. And I'll go back to my template, which is, it's, since I clicked on it, it's already set here as a default. And I'm going to go to edit it. And the third tab here is create conditional format. And then you can see there are all these categories. So the one this involved was speed figure. And you can see I had this for the dark green, which we saw on Gervin. If it's the highest speed figure among all these PPs, it's going to be in green. If it's the second highest, it's going to be in yellow. If it's the highest speed figure in the entire race, it's going to be circled in green. And if it's the highest speed figure at the distance surface, it's going to be circled. I believe that's blue. And that's how we get all of that. There's a lot of functionality, again, things you want to bring to your attention, you know, to remind yourself what was important way back when you set it up. And you can always go back and make changes as well. Um, so Gervin, as we said here, he started his career in a sprint, six furlongs at fairgrounds. Um, he won nicely. 
He came back a month and a half later, two turns in a route, but it was a stake, and he closed nicely for second. His speed figure went down a little bit, but it was his first time on turf and still, you know, ran very well in stakes company. He's going to you know, run pretty well here. Um, we're going to go to number two on trapped. Something I do, and this is very important for fans, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of it. At the Equibase PPs, all our PPs, we have this little triangle. It's a trouble comment. Hover over it. It'll tell you it's trouble. So chart callers are an indispensable part of our game, and they really take a look at everything going on. And so if I see a trouble comment, first thing I want to do, I still trust them. This says two path in the turns, way to the quarter pole. So I want to look at either the video or the chart. So I'll look at the chart first because it'll give me the footnote for untrapped. And I go down to the bottom here. And we'll look at Untrapped. So he raced in two paths on the turn, urged along, waited behind horses, shifted out, closed, drifted out, finished with good courage. Okay, well, that's a very objective assessment by somebody that's been looking at races for years, like a lot of people have. Now I want to see real quick what that's about. Just because you want to figure out, I want to figure out, if he had gotten clear earlier, what might have happened. So the replay comes up pretty quickly. And again, we don't have to watch the whole thing. If I remember correctly, the, the, the issue happened about the eighth pole. Now I'm going to move it to about one minute. Now he was number two, of course. I'll move it a little further. I didn't get it far enough back. You can see he's behind a wall of horses of a mouse. That's where he is right here, untrapped. Still looking for a place to go. It's behind a wedge. Jackie tries to get him out. Another horse comes over. Now he comes all the way out. This is about, I think, the 16th pole, Steve, would you say? Just about to pass it? Yeah. Yeah, at New Orleans, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, 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 That's right, that long the, stretch, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And he's finally going to get out there, right there. And this goes a good courage. So in my mind, anyway, this is totally subjective. It's what handicappers have to do. If he hadn't had to wait for room, um, he maybe, maybe would have won the race. You never know, but certainly... Sometimes you look at a horse and you go, no, nah, he didn't quicken up much. I'm not interested in him. So it's another another angle. So this is what I'm trying to do is put people through my methodology for handicapping this race, taking advantage of all the time savers now. So I didn't have to go off I didn't have to go off the program to look for the race. Another horse here is number three, local hero. And of course we all know when you see or should know when you see a italicized name within the running line. You'll know the horse won its next race, in this case, Blue Ridge Traveler. I'm always curious, even though local hero just broke his maiden, I'm curious of Blue Ridge Traveler. Again, you don't have to go anywhere else to get the information. If you click on the chart here for this January 26th race, that's the chart of this race. But then if you click on Blue Ridge Traveler, it actually brings you up his lifetime PPs. So I know in this race, Blue Ridge Traveler ran second to local hero, and he earned a 78 speed figure running second. And he won his next race, and he improved by five points. With a comment, off slow, close fast, mile 16 to Oakland. So this could end up being a potential key race. Key race, of course, being one where two or more horses come back to win the next start. So it's interesting. The last one is very interesting here, and this is a horse I'm not picking, but I'm not, I wouldn't argue with anybody. This is a horse named Sorry Eric. And he's a horse that, as people can see, he was claimed for $20,000 at the claim race at San at the distance. He won by five lengths. He was claimed by Keith Sormo, and Flavian Pratt wrote him off a claim to a win in the allowance race. Now Kent gets on, and just for the heck of it, after all this success with Exaggerator a couple of years back, I, I wanted to check an angle, and that's the beauty of this. So I have an angle here that says, Trainer DeSormo routes with Kent. And you can click on it, and it will sh really show you what it was. And you'll see, and this is fascinating to me. I, I, I'm Steve, I hope you made a comment. Could you imagine... If you randomly bet every one of those 42 horses where Ken and Keith teamed up in the last year in a route, you have a 43% <laughs> ROI. <laughs> Can you believe it? It, it, it? You know, what's funny is that it, it, what's amazing with them is that there's been this parade. You know, it's now it, it's now protracted. This, this is not, you know, something that right. just happened. It, it's something that no. has been evident, and it, it, it's re, it's remarkable that they still come back and run and are under bet. It, it's right, one correct. of those mysteries. And what's amazing to me, even though it is a small sample, I understand that, 42 races, 
That 33%, by the way, is 14. That's 14 out of 42. So if someone yep. wants to bet a couple of dollars across the board on Sorry Eric, based on my angle, go ahead and do it. He's short on speed figures. You can see as we talked about Gervin 85, but, you know, was it a couple of years ago, DeSormo, what was the big upset he had? Uh, not exaggerating. He had a big upsetter a couple of years back at 100 bucks in one of the derby prep it, races. I'm not uh, and then he got hurt uh, and and couldn't go yeah. on. Uh, he had a multiple a multiple uh, multiple word name. Uh, yeah, I I, I, yeah. I know I'm, I'm a horrible historian. Sorry, folks. Somebody will somebody will chat to that. Absolutely. So now going back to handicapping, the I, I had to point that out because that was such an incredible statistic. You know, the horse book's completely overmatched. Another hand's won two in a row. Who the heck knows? You know, and he's shipping him in, and when he puts Kent up, okay, you know, at that. At that win percentage and that ROI is worth two bucks to win. So going back to Gervin, what was interesting is I commented earlier, you know, these races were on dirt sprint and then turf route. Well, one of the things you want to know, and certainly I do a lot with maidens, is how could the horse perform dirt route? You really have nothing to go on. One of the things that we have in Spacelands, and again, it's nowhere else, it's really easy to do, is we have detailed dam statistics. I'm clicking on the dam. And this is the results of the, all the plodging of the dam in lifetime dirt routes. Now, she's only one for six. But right away, I know, I know, who, I know that horse. <laughs> you know, most people that followed the 2015 juvenile season know the horse. Because this win at Churchill Down uh, back in, well, I'll just pull up his PPs. You can go to his PPs by clicking on that. This win back here, September 12th, was in the Iroquois State. This guy got on the radar. If you're on the, he won Tremont, by the way. I shouldn't say that. And then he won the Iroquois. And then, of course, his three-year-old campaign wasn't good. He ended up running for a claiming price, and it was claimed away. But, you know, there's no doubt in my mind, based on that breeding, going back to PPs now, that Gervin can run a dirt route. So I like the rail. I like the fact he has a two-turn experience. I like the fact that uh, that this is his second race off a layoff. I love the fact that his only sibling won dirt route stakes. So he's my top pick in the race. Um, as we discussed, number two, Untrapped, had that trouble line back there. Um, another horse I haven't talked about yet is Guest Suite, which was actually my second win contender in the race on our Equibase Race the Week analysis. It was Gervin and Guest Suite and Motown. And I'll talk about Motown in some detail for a minute. But again, things I look at in the race, as you saw earlier when I had the customized PPs, this tells me it's the highest speed figure of any horse in the race. So that's good, certainly. And three-year-olds should improve. The second star is three year old, everything goes well, so there's no knock on him at all. He's got tactical speed. He rallied from sixth, he rallied from third. Both his two turn races, back here at Keene in the mile of sixteenth and the fairgrounds, because the Churchill is one turn, were both wins. Um so it's interesting. And both he and Gervin open at six to one. Now I don't think he'll be I don't think Guess will be six to one. Do you? Because he's been favored his last two races. <sighs> you know, when you get the size when you get a field uh, this size, a 14 horse field, and you know you got people that are following certain horses. You know Motown obviously is going to draw his share of money. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how uh, how take off and and untrap fair. Uh, and Asmussen was very bullish on on local hero with me uh, on uh, on the radio Tuesday. Um, I, you know guest suite. I, I think he's got to go favored. Yeah, I, I I think he buys for favoritism. I, I, nine to two? two? Nine to two, man. No, no, I, I still think we'd probably take a shot. So last, of course, is the morning line favorite. Last course, I'm going to highlight a bunch of things in Racelands in PPs that are pros and cons, and we have to weigh these as handicappers. So first of all, there's a lot of talk about last year's Remsen. And I was tweeting the other day, I don't know if you saw it with uh, Mike Hogan, about this year's Remsen. And I went back and I said, uh, I think the 20, was it 2012 run, the revolutionary, of the uh, of the overanalyzed Remsen was one of the most hyped Remsen's of all time. And that was one of the most negative key races in history. Um, and this one might end up being second. But, you know, we know this horse was really good. He won a second and third starts. He improved, went on the bench. But it's so important what horses do coming out of a race to finish behind a winner in the next start. So the first thing I want to do is I wanted to check for myself and see how these horses did. So I can go to the chart. So no dozing finished second to Motown the Remsen. 
I want to see, did he run this year? Yeah, he did. He ran in the Sam Davis. I already knew that, but he was 7-2, and, and he pretty much ran 6th and 7th around the track. So that was a really bad comeback after that pretty good second-place finish here, closing from 7th. Tackleful, who was third here, comes back, and, of course, he runs in Jerome. He's 6-5. to five. Now, he's in the mud, I understand, but he you know, barely finishes the race. Um, interestingly, interestingly enough, the fifth horse, I believe, you're to blame, came back to win an allowance race at Parks, optional claimer. Um, but really, the first two behind him, so that's the comment about even though it's time off, a key race doesn't have to have a time frame to it. So that's one issue. The second now is you've got a horse coming back from basically three months off, going two turns against horses that have run in the last month. Well, is he fit? How good is a trainer at this move? And very interesting, interestingly enough, we know Tony Dutro is a good trainer. Those doubts were removed because I, the, the, the stat that came up automatically, because it, it, the race ones knows what the situation is, is past two years, 60 to 180 on dirt. But I just want to see routes. So I can go here really quick and I can modify this. And I don't have to save it as a new criteria, even though I can if I want to. But I can go to distance and I can just change it to routes. So now it's going to show me the past two years. If I said apply. All horses ran by Tony Dutro who come back from 60 to 180 days off in a dirt route. Well, 4 for 14, I mean, that, that's a good number. I mean, I'm confident in Dutro's ability. So I'm on the fence with Motown. That's one of the reasons why um, I used to, I put him in as my third contender. But I think Gervin's the play, certainly guest suite, even though he's not going to be as good of a win bet. And, you know, Raceline's really saved me a lot of time here getting me to those choices. And now uh, Craig's got some comments on some of the horses as well. Yeah, so um, one of the the first things I'm going to talk about was Motown as as well, and uh, and uh, Ellis has there's a uh, if you look at the angles, uh, Ellis the one for the angle on Motown. Yes, oh, passed him. Yeah, it comes up right away. There it is. Okay, and it tells you. Yeah, is it? So this is what the angle's called. Good. Yeah, so you see that it's three for long, uh, three five for long workouts, including uh, at least one bullet. Uh, into a dirt route, and so if uh, you, Ellis clicks on that angle, you can see that this is just for all horses. Um, that this is a a, a very um, positive angle. I mean, even though the ROI is negative six percent, I mean, random betting is negative twenty five percent, the win percent's twenty percent, the place and show numbers are good. So this tells you that um, a trainer using this type of pattern is strong. So what I did was um, I like to create, uh, you know, I call them ad hoc angles. So with an angle like this, same thing. How Ellis checked uh, Tony Dutro uh, off the off the layoff and saw the in the routes the positive angle. I did the same thing and just added another criteria. So I used all the same criteria for this angle. Just just added, uh, you know, it's, and when you go on the trainer list, it's under Anthony W. Dutro. I added Tony Dutro's name. And I found out that he had um, had six starts with that type of workout pattern, and he had won 50% of the time, so three out of six, with the plus 74% ROI. So for me, coupled with Ellis's angle, I mean, Motown is going to be ready uh, to run. I mean, he's not going to be cranked up 100%. I mean, he's getting ready for the Derby, but the horse is going to be going to be fit. And so. You know, I'm a, probably a little more um, high on him than uh, Ellis might be trying to beat him a little bit more. And so it just shows you that, you know, there's different ways to handicap the race, and Racelands has tools that you can use to help you come up with uh, your own opinion. And uh, because the horse is still, though, when you when you go into the True Odds module, uh, you can see that that um, Motown is is uh, an underlay, though. Because it's such a big field, I mean, you do have the the question marks that Ellis talked about, and so the horse that um, the one that I like to couple with them in the exotics is uh, Untrapped, and and Ellis said, you know, pointed out everything um, that there is to know about him. I I liked the trip they had. I like when horses are on the Kentucky Derby Trail. I like when they have to overcome some kind of, of adversity. I think that helps three-year-olds, it makes them tougher, makes them improve. You know, I like when the horses are in the bigger fields. I think that helps their experience level. And so for me, 
Motown and Untrapped were the two horses that I would key in the different types of wagers, and, and I could see playing those horses in trifectas with some of the horses uh, Ellis mentioned. And so that's kind of the way that I see this race. Craig, tinker a little bit with true odds, and I, I'd, I'd like to discuss a little bit the pace scenario in here. I mean, we got a bulky field, and the, the pace figures under any, virtually under any measurement, that it, it, it's going to be at least honest, if not fast. The one difference in this group of horses to consider is the fact that there's no, there are, there's really nobody in here that is stretching out from sprint to route. When we get to this juncture in, in the, sort of the, the mile to the mile and the 16th, this can be the, you know, the intermediate race between January and, and March, April, where you have horses going from six and seven furlongs out to a mile and a mile and a sixteenth, and we've seen that at other venues. We have not seen as bulky a field uh, you know, other than the Southwest on Monday. I, I look at this group, and you say to yourself, this has got to be a fastish pace. However, because nobody is stretching out, I, I'm not so convinced, and I'd love for you to tinker with the true odds by, by showing some variability in the pace scenario, if the pace is maybe a little slower than anticipated, and then if it is fast, how that would change the true odds for people. Craig, if you want to give me a couple of tidbits since I'm running this to tell me what what I could change there you to do that from here. Sure. So yeah, so that 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 pace number, Ellis, you could you could crank it all the way up to five, and we could see uh, what changes in the adjusted true odds. And then oh, now just sort okay. sort of well, let's see. Yeah. Well, on trap's still a six to one. Um, yeah, it has it has uh, moved him up a little bit, and uh, yes, it has. And uh, and Motown, I mean, it improved slightly. So, you know, it it made it seem like that in a in a fast pace, uh, those horses could improve. I mean, we we saw how Untrapped, uh, you know, made that mo nice move down the stretch last time. So, right, I mean, and that, had those, the problem. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, there's going to be a lot of tactical speed in this race. Local hero, you know, obviously from his three post, is probably going to want the lead. He went 47 in terms of time last time out. Um, untrapped projected faster, according to true odds, and take off a 10. And he's got tactical speed. His only win came wire to wire. So I totally understand. What, what I love about looking at the screen is, I'm going to look at the screen and I'm going to say, why is the 10 rated second at the early and middle calls? And I'll look back and I'll see, oh, well, his only win, we're going to go back to PPs now, the 10 ta takeoff, his only win was leading wire to wire. Well, okay, that tactic worked. Certainly from the outside, you got to get over quick. The instructions for Lepre are going to get over. And that two points, Steve, that does set maybe a really honest pace here, which sets up more and then moves Motown up because he can lay third or fourth. It, it it it's it's going to be a, a a very interesting run to the to the first turn and we'll we'll see who wants to who wants to move around uh, on the back stretch and and gain position if there's going to be some prompting it it's going to come earlier it, it, it's I, that's my biggest problem with this race and I and I've gone back and forth uh, as to what to expect on that front. Because you know the horse that the horse that intrigued me, and you talked about him early on, was Gervin. And you know Joe Sharp, I I love the fact that I don't know if it was out of desperation or you know what the circumstance you know given given the problem that we had down in New Orleans, uh, he had that horse stuck uh, you know out at the Evangeline at the training center when no horses could move and they couldn't come in to race. And so I think he ran in that Keith G uh, to use it as a fitness. I mean, in addition, you know, in addition to, you know, adding a, uh, an opportunity to get a race into him, a second career start, because uh, there's nothing about him that indicated he was going to get a turf opportunity. And I, I actually love the way he ran in that Keith G Memorial. 
and I, I think that he gets a very advantageous suck along trip inside, and I, I certainly get the sense that he's going to be a square price. I mean, it, it's too bulky a field. He's not going to be six to one when they put him in the gate. No, we, probably not. But it's interesting. He, he certainly you know, Hernandez is riding him. Uh, you guys to know him both races, rode him well, and you're right. He, he's going to. He all he has to do is take back a length or two, let the outside speed horses go, let. Uh, local hero go and he could get a great trip just needs a little bit of luck in the last eighth and you do have that long stretch where sometimes if you just get the right break at the right time you can get up yeah I, he's he's got my he's got my attention this is a this is a tremendous tremendous addition and uh, the horse we were reaching for was i've struck a nerve ah that's that was it. The, thank you that was the disarma horse a uh, hundred dollars <laughs> yeah, that's great. Love it. Love yeah, it. thank you, Steve. Yeah, remember, I remember. Yeah, I still, I mean, yeah, well, he's had a good run the last couple of years, but yeah, like I say, two bucks to win on. Sorry, Eric, for me, no matter what else I bet in that race, I promise. Uh, a nice, so a next, nice saver, flyer. Let's turn our attention to the eight, and here's the Grade Three mind shaft uh, that will give rise to the New Orleans handicap uh, on the Louisiana Derby undercard. Yeah, and of course, you know. First thing I want to say is, well, I'm, I'm going to switch first. So when I was talking about the prison star, I was talking about there was no point of showing a very specific template set because they didn't have many starts. So I just wanted to see all their starts. But in this case, you've got horses with a lot of races. And so the first thing I want to look at is how they've done at the fairgrounds on this turf course. Um, so there's a template here, uh, which is today's track, surface, and distance which is this, so it's going to be fairgrounds, turf route, turf sprint, et cetera, et cetera. So I switched to that. And even though you do get a lot of gray lines, it does immediately show some things. And what's fascinating for me is Rise Up doesn't have a thing. But if I start going back here, I notice, oh, wait a second. I, I forgot this. It's back in fall of 2014, um, he won the woodchopper stakes at a mile on the dirt, sloppy, at fairgrounds. So he has a win on the dirt. Of course, we know he won the Delta Jackpot uh, back here in uh, – or the Delta the Jackpot? Another big win. Uh, yeah, Delta Jackpot here on November of 2013 and, you know, earned $600,000 that day. So that's pretty interesting for me. Um, just going down the list real quick, Eagle has all these nice lines again last year from Tenacious, Louisiana, New Orleans. We'll come back to him in a second. Um the, the well, actually, let me stop on Eagle right now. So one of the things with Eagle, one of the reasons you know, all of us like to bet races is we like to be right when other people are wrong. And Eagle is the five to two morning line favorite in a race in which you know, anybody can make the decision that he um, is vulnerable makes it for a much playable race. So that's one of the reasons that I think he, he he's playable. I'm gonna switch back to the lifetime PP just to show the. Again, one of the benefits of using one of these templates to highlight those races and just get in your mind which horses you like. And then you go back, I'm going back to the Lifetime PPs and um, my template. And so going back to this, so back to Rise Up, we talked about those two wins uh, at the fairgrounds. Um, some of the things I have highlighted here again is the highest echo base speed figure of his, which came in as one race back, so it was just last fall. So um, certainly he's maturing. He's six now, but he ran good. That last race, the Delta Mile, um, I don't think he was disgraced. Opening up by seven, getting beat a neck. Uh, very good race here. So certainly a horse that deserves respect. One thing I want to, and I don't know if I'm sure some people have heard this comment. One thing I like to do when I look at horses and start to notice that they win going start to finish is I go back from right to left, and I go to see if they're all ones. In this case, all three of his wins are all ones recently. I, I kind of call it like a picket fence. It reminded me. But then if I see more than one or two horses in addition to him that have the same kind of picket fence, all ones across, um, start, I start looking for closers or stalkers at least because I don't think that they're going to change stripes. So they're going to do that. It's very possible. So it could be, a, could be a potential problem. But back to Eagle, what's really interesting here is he's the morning line favorite. He's been off seven months. Into two turns, um, 
there's nothing like that in his history. All these, of course, are his layoff lines. Um, that was only from May to June. That was February to March. That was January to February. He has no long layoffs that you can use an example into a route. So the next thing, like we did with the uh, Christmas star, check the trainer to go to Neil Howard. Um, in this case, in the individual research, some of the work's already done for us because Graceland knows what kind of race this is. So this is Neil Howard, more than 80 days on dirt. 0 for 5, none of them hit the board. So I think Eagle is very vulnerable here, and that's why I decided to go looking for other horses. It wasn't I went I didn't handicap looking for horses and then say Eagle vulnerable. I went looking at the favorite, he's vulnerable. Now I'm looking for horses to bet. Steve, do you find that philosophy something you use once in a while? Oh, I, I, without a doubt. I mean that's that's the that's the whole that's the whole point. I mean, and whatever you know, whatever element you can you can latch on to to find a, a way to you know, to diminish a potential favorite uh, that, or, you know, a major candidate, uh, that's that's what this game is. Well, the horse that I went looking for, I'm going to go right down to him as number seven, right? I, I, I'm looking for The horse I found was honorable duty. Um, the key is, and that's the circle I have highlighted in the customized PPs, highest echo base speed bigger of any horse in the race period was last time out. Um, and that was at Fairgrounds on a fast track in the Tenacious. And I know you guys talked about that in the last webinar, you and Craig. Um, he was gelded before that start. He also took blinkers off. He had blinkers here, he didn't have blinkers here. So I'm not sure whether it was the removal of blinkers or it was the fact he was gelded. So one of those two were certainly played a part in him running the best race of his career. And I think he can run another huge race uh, based on that. And so he is really playable here because that 116 is the best in the race. And if it competed, he could probably win this race. So it's a good, it's a really, he, he's the horse I looked at. The other one I looked at was the number three, December 7. Um, and he's a newly turned four-year-old. And I like, just like I like three-year-olds and follow as they improve during the spring, I like four-year-olds as they improve as well. Um, He's coming off a career best effort. You can see his echo base speed figure pattern, 84, 95, 91, 97, 101. So that's good. He did go wire to wire in that race. Um, when we get to the rise up, we know he's going to have a lead. But back here at Churchill, he came from just off the pace. His debut came from off the pace. I don't think he's wed to having the lead here. Um, so I think he's a really interesting play here. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out also about oh, I forgot, honorable duty. It was one of the items. Well, as you'll notice here, that I've incorporated my scratches into my PPs. And that's something you can do in customized PPs in this particular template, which is the one that I have, Echo Base Lifetime PPs, just to show folks here. I think that's a really cool feature. And I have merged scratches put in here. And the reason is now because I can check a horse's form cycle and maybe add a little bit of trainer intent into my handicapping. So I'm thinking to myself that he won nicely. On a fast track, track came up muddy. He had no interest in running in the mud, and he scratched him. And so that's fine with me. It's not like it was a vet scratch or stewards or anything like that. It ended up being a very, very positive play. So that's why back to honorable duty is a good pick. Uh, December 7, as I said, he's got tactical speed to sit second off the uh, the likely leader rise up who's got the rail and is a need to lead type. He's got a shot. And then there are a bunch of horses I think you can use in exotics, dazzling gem who, again, has a, a, his career best echo wave speed figure last time out, a very nice second after making the lead in the stretch in the Louisiana Stakes. Um, Mo Tom, who can be coming from way back and needs a little traffic luck, as he did last year in the three-year-old preps, didn't get it. Um, he's coming back a left in September, but I, I'm not as concerned about deep closers coming back off a long layoff. Um, and International Star, another deep closer who's coming back from a big layoff. So you get... Three horses all coming back from significant layoffs in this race. I think Greg has a terrific group. Steve, you have I, well, I'll just ask about Dalmore, who uh, Dalmore with the with the Sormo and his ability, you know, his ability to set up shop the behind rise up. Uh, Dalmore to me looks like a horse that it could be very dangerous uh, with a with a tactical speed and a and a close up trip if. Uh, if the Sorma wants to attack it this way, I I don't my my I think this is a terrific group and I 
Dazzling Gem was a horse that I wanted behind. I was excited on Monday about betting him behind uh, Gunrunner uh, at Oakland. And it was interesting that Brad Cox chose to, to run here. Uh, th- there's a lot of hungry horses in this group. And uh, I'd be anxious to see, you know, how aggressive people get. And Jim Graham has got to make a decision, as you bring up, uh, Ellis, with December 7th. And, in fact, uh, Marty McGee was with me today. Uh, Paul McGee, very excited about uh, December 7 coming into this, uh, the prep uh, work that he's put in for his four-year-old debut. Uh, there's a lot going on in this group. Yeah, there is. And back to Dalmore, he was a, a horse I liked last year early uh, when he won the affirmative slight upset. Um, then they took on uh, you know older horses right away, the Chrome, both Chromes, California Chrome and Texas Chrome, um, and they were on the shelf a little bit. Came back, ran third in the San Pasquale, and then that real clunker in the San Antonio. But again, there's that angle we talked about in the last race, the case with Kent. Um, certainly worth noting, six to one is a lot lower than thirty to one, which we are getting on. Sorry, Eric, at the Risen Star, but just the same. You know, if you if you believe in those stats, random bets on you know angles that upwards of thirty percent ROI certainly aren't a bad uh, comment. Craig, I know you had some thoughts on this one. Uh, yeah, so um, I'd like to look at uh, honorable duty, and that's the that's the horse. You know, for all the reasons that you pointed out, um, I like that horse. And uh, something else that and I and you talked about it when I um, the first race that we talked about earlier today that that I did. When I'm um, scanning the PPs, when when I look at the uh, the jockey and the trainer, when I look at the situational statistics for his last 30 days with the jockey, the scent surface, whenever all that is highly positive ROI, so you know here anything over two dollars is positive, and it's always highlighted green. I mean all that catches my eye right away, and I'm always going to try to to find something to make a case for that horse. And you know you pointed out all the things about how he was gelded. How he um, had the blinkers off, you know, his best speed rating he's he's ever ran, better than any of the other horses have have run. So I mean, everything about this horse is very positive to me. And so I, I you know, I, I'm I'm with you. Like he's my my top pick in this race. And then the other horse that I uh, lean towards is the number six, Dazzling Gem. And um, we don't have to look at it, but the horse is the um, Top rated on the adjusted true odds for the race, which you can see the on the PP screen, by about. the way. You, you don't, yeah, yeah, you don't, yeah, right there. Right, you're exactly right. On true odds, he's the top horse. And um, the other thing that I like is when you were um, pointing out how it, how it had uh, run such a strong Equibase speed figure last time. I like the pattern of all the last three speed ratings. It went from 93 to 104 to 106 to 110. You know, and it's the same type of thing you talked about, Alice, when horses are going from the end of their two-year-old to the beginning of their three-year-old year or three to four-year-old. Whenever they're on that type of improvement pattern, that that's always a, a very good sign, and, and that's something I look for, and I, and I like to bet on that that type of horse. And so those were the, the two horses that were key for me in this race. Do you have any thoughts on uh, those horses or anybody else? Is something a quick look at it. We're getting near the end of the webinar, but uh, Craig and I kind of agree. Honorable Duty was my top pick, and Craig apparently too. And then uh, Dazzling Gem, December 7, of course, to look at. Uh, a lot depends on the pace, of course. Be there. Yeah, I'm here. Pull, uh, let's pull up. we got about four and five minutes. Let's pull up the Rachel Alexandra, the ninth. And let's, do, let's okay. see at least what the true odds is showing in there. This is a, this is a sure. very good group. And, of course, it's the only week uh, we're going to get a chance to bet the Oaks futures. And you do have three Phillies in here that are on uh, that board. Well, as you can see here, Valdorn and Untapped are both. 7-2 right now for the true odds, and untapped is certainly a horse that is an overlay based on the morning line if that holds up. Um, you've got a couple of long shots here. 
and Majestic Quality, who's eight to one. Uh, true, that's a true odds. Who's twenty to one morning line and Gris Gris, who's there. So you know, those are the things you look at. And the pace scenario, it looks like Shane's girlfriend, of course, California Speed probably is correct, so she will be in front. This has her kind of fading at the end to Valdorna and Untapped. You do, you know, and you got Farrell that certainly I, I know was a probably a frustrating it was a frustrating outcome for Wayne Catalano and the team at at Oakland on Monday, uh, wheeling on the front end with uncontested. Uh, but th- there always seemed to be a question with him. Farrell, uh, you know, coming off that Silver Bullet Day effort where she looked a winner every single step, and uh, that's you know that's a uh, this is going to be a, a an interesting portion with Shane's girlfriend outside her. We'll see what Channing Hill wants to do, and and frankly, untapped Steve Asnison with me on Tuesday. Asnison, he says that he didn't want to reveal it. He he, he was a little close to the vest on this, but he he said he knows he felt like he knows what was wrong in the Silver Bullet Day with untapped, and he expects her to run much much better. And uh, Asmussen wouldn't wouldn't have talked like that if he, if he was not confident. So to me, it looks like there's a lot of speed right inside. The three of them could all start going shoulder to shoulder from the bell. And I, gosh, doesn't this set up for Valadorna to to let the speed kind of unfold in front of her, and she can set up shop behind them? Yeah, she definitely will be making a big run. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why she came up so strong on the true odds. Also coming off a career vest, Echoway Street figure. I tell you, the, you know, the other the other horse, and I got to look at her a little more closely. I'll do my capping tonight in advance of tomorrow's weekend preview on the show. But Wicked Lick uh, is a horse that nobody's talked about uh, all week. Everybody's focused on uh, Farrell and Valadorna and uh, etc. Shane's girlfriend. The, Farrell, Shane's girlfriend, and Valadorna are in the future wager for the Oaks. Uh, Untapped did not make the list of 23 betting interests, but Wicked Lick, what did she do wrong in that Silver Bullet day? And Brendan Walsh, uh, just uh, a guy that is showing up uh, in, in more and more big spots, does a tremendous job, especially with route horses. Uh, got a lot of respect for uh, horses uh, under, under Brendan Walsh's care. She yeah, comes, she's back to the spot. 10 to 1. 10 to 1. Well, a, a terrific card on Saturday in New Orleans, and we hope that uh, everybody does well, utilize Sats Race Lens, and you've got an opportunity. We want to flip this in because we typically will have a, a special offer and a quarterly subscription for new customers. If you're tuning in and listening in for the first time. If you haven't yet subscribed and tried the product, a one-month subscription will get you a quarter worth. We'll get you three months worth. So effectively, uh, you'll get March, April, and well into May if uh, you try Stats Race Lens for the first time. Uh, You also have got to be following Stats Race Lens on Twitter, uh, the daily angles and the, the great discussions, and you can utilize customer service support via the Twitter account, Stats Race Lens. Follow it. You should be following Uber Capper, of course, and taking advantage of all kinds of free opinions that uh, Alice is offering uh, at uh, the website, and then as well as his more uh, involved analysis and uh, anything you need directly to Alice, to me, to Stats Race Lens, uh, all... uh, in the idea of helping you do better at the races. And uh, there's no better feeling than discovering an angle that the general public has missed. And if you use this product that way, you will find them. You will also, using your angles, uh, you will get yourself an email. Make sure that you take advantage of that feature. This may be the greatest, the absolute greatest, stable male product ever because it's not just telling you that a horse is coming up for a race. It also is going to tell you the angle that you like 
uh, when that horse is going to run. So take advantage of all that there is to offer at Stat Race Lens. We thank Craig, we thank Ellis, and we thank all of you for participating. Best of luck, and we'll talk to you again in a few weeks. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody.